Stevenson, I'm a community organizer with Post Oil Solutions, which sponsors this uh, monthly event, the Climate Cafe. Um, I want to give special thanks to Star and her staff and the uh, Brooks Library, which, as usual, uh, go out of their way for the citizens of this region. Um, it's, it's one of our treasures. It is our treasure. All right, let's get on with Dr. Cameron. Um, Dr. Cameron is originally from Dublin, Ireland, and he recently moved to Manchester. How long ago was that? Uh, January. January, right. Um, and not coincidentally, I think, that is where his wife is from, uh, from Manchester. So uh, Dr. Cameron is, has an international career working with both the European Union and the World Bank. For nine years, he was with the EU working on climate change and sustainable cities. From there, he earned a PhD that focused on the intersection of climate change and human rights. Very interesting intersection, I would say. Um, then he went to work for the government of the Maldives, was responsible for public diplomacy and climate change. He helped build their climate adaptation strategy and was part of their team that negotiated within the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change that resulted in the 2015 Paris Climate Accord. I assume that most of you know the Maldives is probably the most threatened uh, country in terms of, of uh, the oceans over, overwhelming it. Um, and the interesting thing about the Maldives is that uh, it, it is a low-lying country for sure, but it is on, not on sand, it's on coral which makes it even like a double jeopardy in a way, because as you all know, um, coral is rapidly disintegrating because of the increasing warmth and acidity of the oceans. All right, after his work in the Maldives, Dr. Ma uh, Dr. Cameron joined the World Bank, where he not only met his future wife, he again worked on human rights and climate change. From there, he went to work for the World Resources Institute in Washington, D.C., trying to persuade policymakers in the United States, as well as internationally, through the UN to be more ambitious on the climate. Can we send you back down there now to continue that work? <laughs> All right, he is presently, and uh, let me get this right. Uh, actually, it's not any one organization. He is a consultant with several. So without further babbling from me, let me introduce and help me welcome Dr. Edward Cameron. Thank you. Uh, first, I would like to thank Tim for uh, the very gracious invitation to ask me to come out on a dreadful stormy evening all the way from Manchester to Brattleboro to be with you and to then have to drive all the way home over the mountain again at the end of this. Um, but I am actually delighted that you invited me and very grateful for the opportunity to speak to you. And I hope it will be a conversation this evening and not just a, a lecture. So a couple of things that I'd like to say um, by way of housekeeping. Uh, the first is Everything I'm about to present to you this evening would be absolutely non-controversial in 196 countries around the world. Unfortunately, it's not non-controversial in this particular country at this particular moment. So with that in mind, I really want to emphasize that this is an open conversation where all viewpoints are welcome, all viewpoints are legitimate. If you express a viewpoint that is counter to one of my viewpoints, you may very well find me contesting it quite robustly. But if you have disagreements, as well as questions, I would strongly invite you to speak. It's very, very important that we have a discussion, and it's very important that all viewpoints are welcomed in the room. Uh, we will be getting into some issues of politics. There are going to be conversations uh, and elements to this that relate to science, and I'm going to emphasize scientific consensus, and I'm going to emphasize the importance of fact. <laughs> 
there are legitimate disputes about what you do with facts, what types of policies you put in place, what types of philosophy inform those policies, they're all very, very legitimate disagreements that any healthy political system needs to have. But you must start from a foundation of facts. So I'll be presenting the scientific facts and I'll be explaining why they are robust. We'll be talking a lot this evening about the actions that people can take as individuals and as agents of change within their communities. And I know already that many of you are existing agents of change within this community. So I hope when the time comes for us to have a conversation that you won't just question, but that you'll also relay some of your own experiences, whether on this issue or on related issues, leading within this community. Because one of the things that I will address is the fact that climate change sits at a nexus with many, many other issues, with human rights, with gender, with inclusive economy issues. It's not just an environmental issue, it is a human issue and touches upon every facet of human existence. I'm from Ireland, as you can hear from my voice, and over the course of the last 20 years, I've worked in communities right around the globe. Um, I have a tendency to speak a little bit quickly, as many Irish people do, so if at any moment you feel as if I'm going too quickly and you need me to slow down, please put up your hand. If at any point you want to stop me, this is not a monologue, please feel free to put up your hand and interject at any moment. Don't feel as if you have to wait until the end to make a comment. We will pace this in a way that makes it as interactive uh, as possible. Okay? Good, great. Okay, so there are essentially four main topic areas that we're going to go through step by step. And the first is we're going to try and understand climate risk and we're going to try and understand climate resilience. And I'm going to explain that both of these issues are three-dimensional and that historically we have ignored critical dimensions to this issue. And that means that by poorly diagnosing the problem, we've often failed to put in place the right sorts of solutions. So I'm going to surface some of that. I want to talk about why we can feel confident in the evidence because I speak publicly quite a lot all over the world to various types of audiences. In the last three months I spoke to 20 ministers, I spoke to CEOs, and just last week I spoke to a collection of 12 year olds. And every single time this issue of how can we trust what it is you are saying comes up. And so it's very important to have that discussion about what does the evidence look like, but also what is the accumulation of evidence and analysis saying to us and why we think we can trust it. So we'll touch upon that briefly. I'm going to talk a little bit then about what I'm saying is a vision for a just and sustainable world. And this is my own language for explaining to you the Paris Agreement, what being in the agreement means, and what withdrawing from the agreement entails. And the reason I phrase it like this is because the Paris Agreement is not an environmental, international act of diplomacy. It is, in fact, a blueprint for an inclusive, low carbon and climate resilient global economy. It is a stimulus package for the global economy. And to not have that as one of your points of reference means that you cannot properly interpret what is going on currently in Washington and, and beyond. And this is a very timely moment for this discussion because the next large scale gathering mirrored on the Paris uh, summit is taking place in two weeks in Germany. So it's a, a moment really to reflect as we begin to build from Paris onwards. And then finally, we'll talk about what you, can, what you can do to reduce your own greenhouse gas emissions, but also to be leaders within your household, within your communities, within your workplace, and to think also about what you can do to enhance uh, resilience. Now, one thing to bear in mind, I have my own glasses over here, so many of you will probably identify with being slightly short-sighted. Don't worry about having to read through these slides at all. I will explain what's on the slides, this is going to be more storytelling than it is going to be looking at the, at the deck. And if anyone amongst you is interested in having a copy of these slides, my email will be on the final slide. You will just have to send me an email. I will respond to you within a day and you'll have this deck to look at on your own computers. So don't struggle and squint. Just relax, enjoy a deep Irish voice, and let's engage in conversation. So, I always describe climate change as consisting of three collision courses. And what I mean by that is, first and foremost, we are on a collision course as a consequence of the pollution that we are spewing into the atmosphere. And this pollution has been generated for tens of thousands of years. It goes back to the dawn of human civilization when we first started to settle the land and farm the land. So it's not a recent phenomenon. 
But what we are doing is that through the production of greenhouse gases, things like carbon dioxide and methane, we are changing the composition of the atmosphere. And as a consequence of changing the composition of the atmosphere, we're having the second collision course. That is the collision that happens when the atmosphere changes and those changes begin to impact socio-ecological systems. So the first thing that happens when you change the composition of the atmosphere is global mean temperatures begin to rise. And the reason they begin to rise is because heat and light comes from the sun, hits the earth, and then a lot of it radiates back into space. But we have, of course, an atmosphere. And that atmosphere is either designed or created, depending on your philosophy, to trap some of those gases and to trap some of that heat in order to give us the climate that we have. But all of the pollution we're putting into the atmosphere is changing that composition, and so as a result, more of the light, more of the heat is trapped here on Earth. So global mean temperatures begin to rise. When global mean temperatures begin to rise, we see a whole series of knock-on effects. We see threats to unique systems and biodiversity. So for example, Tim mentioned earlier coral reef systems. Coral reef systems are responsible for 25% of all marine life. And those coral reef systems around the world are breaking down because of acidification of the oceans. In other words, a lot of that pollution is now falling into the oceans and being stored there because of warming temperatures of the oceans that are no longer conducive to the life forms that form around coral reef systems. We see similar patterns repeating themselves with other forms of ecosystems and other types of biodiversity. We're seeing ecosystem fragmentation and collapse, and of course, we're seeing biodiversity patterns changing around the world as well. Second of all, when you have global mean temperatures rising, you have changes to the distribution of water around the world in multiple ways. First of all, those places that are susceptible to drought become more susceptible to even more intense and frequent droughts. Those places that are susceptible to floods, more intense, more frequent floods. Those places that depend upon glacial water for their safe drinking water begin to suffer because the glaciers melt and as a consequence the flow of safe water is no longer as consistent and secure as it used to be. Fresh rivers become affected by salt water intrusion. As the seas rise, as more and more sea swells and storm surges occur, more and more seawater comes into fresh water supplies. So a huge consequence for global water. Third issue, extreme weather events, and we'll go into that in a bit more detail in just a moment, but everyone here I'm sure will have seen what happened in the Atlantic Basin during the course of this particular hurricane season in 2017. The science tells us that what you see with global mean temperature rises is an increase in, quote, the intensity and frequency of extreme weather events. So you see all of these things begin to happen, and of course they have an impact not just on these ecosystems, but on human systems on lives, on human rights, on where we can live, on human mobility, on human health. If you, for example, have vector-borne and waterborne diseases on the rise, that means things like malaria and dengue fever and yellow fever and tick infestations come into communities that weren't previously susceptible to them and they come in more often. It means places again like the Maldives become subjected to social breakdown. Now, Tim was right to point out that the Maldives is the most vulnerable country on Earth. It has 1,200 islands that are inhabited, and not a single one is more than a meter above sea level. And that means that by the end of this century, those islands are scheduled to disappear from the face of the Earth. But a much more immediate problem faces the Maldives, and that is that 50% of the economy and 50% of all employment in the islands are dependent on fisheries and tourism, which are both dependent on the coral reef systems. So by the middle of this century, with the decimation of those coral reef systems, there are no longer any jobs for those people. And if we defend the islands, we're simply walling them behind poverty. Third issue to bear in mind in terms of the third collision course is that all of this has a disproportionate effect on marginalized and vulnerable populations. That means people of color. That means low-income populations. That means, for example, women. One of the Stories I'll tell in a moment is about the country of Bangladesh. And in Bangladesh, 90% of all fatalities to extreme weather events are women. This is not because the women are subjected to a hurricane that a man is not subjected to. It's because a woman cannot leave home without a male guardian, has never been taught how to swim, has never been taught how to climb a tree, 
does not have access to information and therefore doesn't know when the storm is coming, does not have access to decision making and therefore cannot work with her own local municipality to build strategies for resilience, has no access to financial services and therefore cannot save money or access credit to rebuild her life when the storm hits and her livelihood and her home are taken. So what you see is climate change colliding with a whole series of other what we call intersecting inequalities right around the globe. And as a consequence of that, we're seeing a magnification of risk. So it's very important to always think of this, not just as an environmental issue, but as a social issue as well. Now, this is something that has been happening over the course of a long period of time. And many of you will be familiar with the science already and with the graphics already, so I'm not going to dwell on these things. But the reality is we have been observing the global climate for a very long time. We have various scientific me methods that enable us to understand the composition of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and the effects that that growing concentration has on the climate system. But our understanding of the climate system actually goes back thousands and thousands of years because ice cores and tree rings help us to understand the level of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere at any given moment in history. And so we can track back over a very, very long period to understand what previous climates looked like, what the previous concentration of greenhouse gases were, and as a consequence, help us understand what changes are likely to happen. There is no doubt when you look at the science that all of the effects we're seeing today and all of the projections we have about the coming decades are accelerating. And they're accelerating because when you look at the evidence and you would examine all of the potential causes for why this happens, solar flares, tectonic movements, volcanic eruptions, proximity to the sun, all of the various possible, plausible, feasible reasons why the climate could be changing. When you examine all of those, the only final logical conclusion you can come to is that the climate is changing because of what we have done since the Industrial Revolution. The way in which we have burned fossil fuels for transport, for electricity, for energy to feed manufacturing, and of course, predominantly, along with our energy use, the use of land. So when you look at the science, and the most recent comprehensive scientific assessment on this issue was 14,000 pages long, the only three words coming out of that scientific assessment that you need to remember is, first of all, unequivocal. This is happening and there is no doubt about it. Second word, accelerating. It is getting faster. You see from this slide that we are breaking the records for hottest year, year upon year upon year. And third, human induced. This is not the result of natural cycles as much as we would like it to be. This is a result of human activity. Now the good news is that if it is the result of human ingenuity, it can be solved by human ingenuity. So it is extremely important that we look at this, we examine it closely, we diagnose it properly, but then we understand that we are agents of change and that we are empowered and that we can make the right choices in our politics, in our use of resources, and in our daily lives to actually turn this around and create, once again, a climate that is more conducive to our success as a species. Now, when we're thinking about climate risk, I mentioned earlier that there are three dimensions we should always bear in mind. And these three dimensions are hazard, exposure, and vulnerability. And what that means is if you take an extreme weather event as an example, that is a climate hazard. A hurricane is a climate hazard. But a climate hazard like a hurricane isn't really something for us to worry about if it only exists out in the ocean and if it passes harmly up on the outskirts of the coast without making landfall. So in order for the hurricane to actually be a risk to us, it must have a second component. We must be exposed to it. In other words, it must make landfall and come into contact with human settlements, with infrastructure, with population centers. You see the comparison, for example, between Hurricane Jose and Hurricane Irma. Hurricane Jose went up along the Atlantic coast, did not make landfall, didn't make the news. Hurricane Irma went right through Naples and right up through uh, Florida. So the second component is really important. When we're thinking about risk, we're thinking really about exposure as well as hazard. The third component is the one that's often ignored and consequently misdiagnosed. And that is the issue of vulnerability. And vulnerability is a word that comes from the Latin vulnare, which means underlying weakness. Now to give you an example of what that means in the real world, 
I have epilepsy, which is a medical neurological condition. And as somebody with epilepsy, I can have a seizure if a certain number of triggers are active. And one of those triggers is stress, and one of them is a lack of sleep. So whereas my wife can work through the night without breaks and right through the following day, I can't do that because I have an underlying weakness that my wife does not have. She might be exposed to the same issue, sleepless night, as I am, but she doesn't have that same underlying weakness. And when we deal with the issue of climate change, what we have to always bear in mind is what are the underlying weaknesses. One of the most important underlying weaknesses is human rights, in fact. If you have access to information, you can make plans because you know the storm is coming, you're provided with some sort of disaster preparedness, you can therefore make contingency plans. If you have access to decision making, you can determine together with your local representatives how to deploy the resources available to your community in order to be resilient. And if you have access to justice and somebody fails to help you in your resilience, you can litigate. If you have none of those things, you have an underlying weakness when it comes to climate change. And there are many, many more which we'll get into in just a second. We've already gone through that. Now I want to give you two specific examples that illustrate this whole idea of underlying weakness. And one relates to people, and one relates to infrastructure. Many of you will recall that a few years ago, a super storm Sandy went through uh, New York. And one of the companies that was most affected by super storm Sandy was Verizon. And Verizon lost its network, and it lost a billion dollars as a consequence of losing its network. The other mobile operators and telecommunications companies were not affected in the same way. And the reason they were not affected in the same way is because they used fiber optic cabling <coughs> for their communications infrastructure, and Verizon used copper wiring. And copper wiring disintegrates in salt water. So again, you have the same hazard, you have the same exposure, but you have one company that has an underlying weakness that it did not address, and you have the other companies that had addressed that weakness and consequently were resilient. The result being Verizon loses a billion dollars, has to put in place the fiber optic cabling that it should have done before, loses customers to rivals who now think the rivals are more resilient and more dependable, and takes a massive reputational hit. And this same pattern is repeated in different companies right across the globe. Those who are prepared and who understand their underlying weaknesses move to correct them. Those that don't, they suffer severe business risks and threats to business continuity. And I talked earlier about the women in, in Bangladesh. And that same issue of gender vulnerability exists in other countries around the world. Don't think it's something that only happens here because the, uh, in Bangladesh. Because the little girl on the far right she is a little girl who is now a climate refugee in this country. And the illustration that I would like to give there is that my own in-laws have a house in Naples, Florida. And when the hurricane hit Naples, they came to stay with my wife and I, our very own climate refugees. However, they are prosperous people. They run a small business in Manchester. They run an inn. As a consequence, they have a reinforced home in Naples. They have a bank account that is sufficient to cover any damages that were done. They have insurance policies that cover the vast majority of damage that was done. This family on the far right was not so lucky. They live in mobile accommodation, trailer park. The trailer park, of course, contains homes that were built out of wood, not reinforced concrete. They did not have insurance coverage. As a consequence of an act of God, they are not going to be covered. And because they're a low-income family, they do not have a reservoir of financial uh, backbone to be able to call upon to rebuild their lives. You had the same exact trend repeated in Harvey, and of course, years ago, you had the same exact trend repeated with Hurricane Katrina. So right across the globe, what we see are people on the margins, people who are often people of color and low-income populations, being especially exposed to climate risk. Now that becomes extremely important when we think about how we build resilience because it helps us to understand that you cannot only build a flood defense, you cannot only pour concrete and create infrastructure if you want to make people resilient in the face of climate risk. You've got to tackle issues of inclusion, you've got to tackle e issues of economic disparity, you've got to tackle societal inequalities if you want to tackle the issue of resilience. <coughs> 
And that means that we begin to look at climate holistically again, not just as an ecological or environmental issue, but as something that requires societal change to deal with a societal problem. Now the cost of this is not only borne by the most vulnerable, it's borne by all of us collectively as a community, and it has significant opportunity costs. Because with all of the money that we're spending, rebuilding after disasters, that money could be spent on revitalizing LaGuardia Airport in New York, for example, or building the new roads that we need here, or building transport corridors that we need here. That could be invested in new infrastructure as opposed to being piped constantly back into rebuilding those things that we did not build properly the first time. So you see from this particular slide that we've had 200 extreme weather events related to climate over the course of the last couple of decades and the cost of all of that is 1.1 trillion dollars. That is massive amounts of money in the context of the United States and when you amplify that with the other countries around the world you see that we are talking about serious serious amounts of money that we are losing as a consequence of not understanding and reacting to this issue as appropriately as we should be. Now one of the things that I want to emphasize is that there are ways in which we can go about righting this wrong and preparing communities to be more resilient. And what the best available thinking on climate resilience tells us, yes, sorry, go ahead. I was wondering if you had a number for, um, so it was the 200 largest yep. since 1980, at 1.1 trillion, so I'm wondering if there is an expanded number where taking it into account um, disasters that might come in under a billion dollars, you know? Like, for instance, there are like fires out sure. west. Um, there would be numbers for that. I don't have those numbers. But that, that is absolutely correct. What I was presenting there was large-scale events. Now, there are also some numbers that have been calculated recently to look at the current hurricane season in the Atlantic. And the most recent projections that I've seen is that Harvey and Irma alone are scheduled to cost $290 billion. Um, now, that doesn't include, for example, Nate and Maria and Jose and Ophelia. The six hurricanes that happened, I'd just like to call them the Brady Bunch kids because there's three girls and three boys. But they're going to cost, I would say, upwards of $500 billion once the hurricane season's over. Now, if you include, of course, what's happening in California with the wildfires and all the rest of it, exponentially you'll see the amount of money rising, but I don't know those figures. And as far as the actual the number, is that property damage, or does that take into account um, like a family having to move from Florida to Michigan or something? You know, where so the cost of relocation would be pretty significant, et cetera, et cetera. So all of the economic assessments of the impacts of climate change will contain different parameters. And so the most recent study that I read, it had parameters for projected climate impacts over the coming years between five and $25 trillion, precisely because on the lower scale of the spectrum, you're only including damage to assets, and on the higher end of the spectrum, you're including loss of livelihoods, relocation costs, healthcare costs, et cetera, et cetera. So the projection you come out with, or the amount you come out with, is very much dependent on the parameters you put into the investigation. What this one here de deals with is the loss of assets, physical assets. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Any other questions at this point before we move on? No? Okay. So here are some things that the best available knowledge tells us we can actually do to begin to counter this particular issue. And these are called the six capital assets. And the thinking is, if you begin to invest in one or more of these capital assets, you can begin to move from a position of risk to a position of resilience. So for example, human capital means preparing people to be able to understand and therefore deal with climate change. It focuses, for example, on workplace training, so that if there is an extreme weather event coming, the people who are working for you in your facility can not only be agents of resilience within the workplace, but you're teaching them how to be agents of resilience within their community and their household. It means building through education. We were talking about education earlier. It means building through education our understanding of this issue and our ability to react to it. Physical capital means thinking about our infrastructure, making sure that the infrastructure we build today 
understands and is informed by climate models and is therefore climate proofed. So for example, we don't want to be building flood defenses that are misrepresenting projected sea level rise. We want flood defenses that are grounded in science. We don't want to be using building codes that are more related to the world as it existed 30 years ago as opposed to related to this world. And that's very important, for example, in the Caribbean, where we see over the course of the last 15 years, the hurricane belt gradually widening and moving. And as a consequence, places that previously were not part of the hurricane season are now part of the hurricane season. My own country, Ireland, was hit by a hurricane about a week and a half ago. It was the largest hurricane ever to form east of the United States, and it was the first major storm to hit Ireland since 1961. It's simply unheard of for a hurricane to land, make landfall in Ireland. And as a consequence, all of the infrastructure that we had was ill-prepared for a storm of this magnitude. So very important to focus on physical capital. It's also very important to focus on natural capital. One of the reasons why New Orleans was so badly hit by Katrina and Rita all those years ago is because over successive decades, the wetlands were removed from around New Orleans. And those wetlands had historically slowed down and taken away the intensity of extreme weather events long before they reached major population centers. So if we invest more in natural capital, in mangroves and in wetlands, we can begin to make our communities more resilient. We've also got to think about, under natural capital, how we deal with urban sprawl and population centers in places where they should not be. One of the reasons why the cost of Irma is going to be so high in Florida is because there are so many more people living there than was previously the case, and they are living so close to the coast now in comparison to what it used to be. So we are exposing people to far more of these natural events as a consequence of poor urban planning. The issue of financial capital is extremely important because we are only going to be able to reduce emissions and build resilience if we mobilize finance at the appropriate scale. We live in a global economy of $90 trillion, and yet the vast majority of that global economy is high carbon in nature and is not geared towards building societal resilience. So we've got to do a few things with financial capital. First, we've got to mobilize more money in support of low carbon development. And second of all, we've got to enhance access to financial services for those people who are the most vulnerable, whether it's low income populations or women, for example. And then finally over here, political capital. In order for us to build societies that are conducive to climate resilience, we've got to have political systems that are able to deal with this issue. And it would have been maybe 10 years ago that I would have pointed my finger at emerging economies or developing countries or least developed countries, and I would have said those countries do not have political systems that are conducive to climate resilience. Well, guess what? Now they do, and this country doesn't. So this refers to a constant process of political renewal, civil, civic engagement, education of policymakers, exercising our power as voters, participation in the political system, so that we have a situation where government is held accountable on this issue and actually works to lead on this particular issue. Now, how do we know that everything I've just said in the last number of moments isn't absolute nonsense? Well, the reason we know it is because we have something called the scientific method. And the scientific method gives us everything from the toaster that you'll use for your bread tomorrow morning to the epilepsy medication I will take before I go to bed. Everything we have is a consequence of the scientific method, which is posing questions, testing those questions against hard evidence, allowing other people to use the same methods and test those questions again and again and again and again, reviewing the evidence cons constantly, going back over our missteps and correcting those missteps, and gradually, through a process of accumulation, coming to a set of facts. And we know that they're facts because if others test them under the same conditions, we will come to the same conclusions. These are not theories, these are facts. Now what we have at the moment, when you turn on the nightly news, particularly if you turn on certain channels rather than others, is you will get the impression that climate change is an open debate subject to variable opinions with one side saying this and one side saying that. You'll have two people arguing on the television screen, so it looks like a 50-50 conversation. It's not a 50-50 conversation. 
97% of all peer-reviewed science going back decades and even centuries is in full agreement with those three words I said earlier, unequivocal, accelerating, human-induced. There is no dispute. 3% of the science disputes that this is happening in peer-reviewed journals. Now, a lot of the times, and I got this question recently when I spoke at a bookstore, somebody said, well, yes, but this morning I read an article that said this. And I said, tell me the name of the article, and they told me. And I looked up the name of the article, and I looked up the name of the author. And it took me 30 seconds to come back to that person and say, like the old Nixonian quote, all you have to do is follow the money. All you have to do is figure out who is the organization that commissioned that piece of work. Who is the author of that piece of work? Did they allow that piece of work to be peer-reviewed? Did they publish that piece of work in a reputable publication? Those four questions in 30 seconds, you can determine that the organization that funded the piece of work was the Cato Institute, that the money that came for the piece of work was from the Heartland Institute, that the author of the piece of work has made a whole career earning $150,000 per year exclusively to write articles like this for both the tobacco industry and the fossil fuel industry. It doesn't take an awful lot if you know how to look for the evidence. But the problem is that too many people in this country are not presented with the facts, they're presented with opinion. And unfortunately, because of the nature of the society as it's become, opinion now rules. We've got to get back, if we want to solve this and other problems, to an understanding of common facts as a basis for discussion. I said earlier 196 countries around the world would not find this controversial. Those countries are governed by theocrats in Iran and Saudi Arabia, by communists in China and Vietnam, by Christian Democrats in Germany, by conservatives in Austria, by social democrats in France, by socialists in Italy, Every spectrum of the political ideology that you can think of, every major faith as an origin of philosophy that you can think of, is uniformed in its viewpoint on this issue. It even shows up here, 32 National Academies of Science have published this information. And what I haven't put up here is that all the major oil companies in the world and all the major oil producing nations of the world agree to this and have signed up to the Paris Agreement. So if you're Saudi Arabia and the only thing you have to generate prosperity and jobs in your country is the oil you take out of the ground and you believe all of this is correct and you want to take action on this, then what's our problem? So this is robust, this is fact-based, and now we need to get on to the legitimate conversation about do we raise taxes or not? Or do we prioritize this against prioritizing other things? That's a very legitimate conversation. You can come back to me and you can say, I want tax cuts, I don't want to invest in resilience. That's a philosophical conversation. That's perfectly fine. But it has to be grounded, first and foremost, with a common understanding of facts. Sir, please. Uh, I've, I've known these, this argument for a long time. But I have, I have a question right now, which is the 3%. Are any of those people legitimate scientists that have used the same data as the 97% and come up with the conclusion that it's not happening? Or are they those paid shills? I, I mean, are, are yeah. the 3%, any of the 3% legitimate science? I, I would say yes. I would not say that all of them are legitimate, but I would say that many of them are. And what they're arguing about legitimately is they're arguing about ranges and they're arguing about projections in the temperature models. And that is very, very important that they continue to do that. Um, there have been, for example, problems in the data in the past about what is the extent of sea level rise, what is the extent of glacier melt, what is the so-called carbon or, or climate forcing of these greenhouse gas emissions. It's very important to bear in mind that science is a very competitive field. It's set up to be a very competitive field. You build your reputation as a scientist by debunking other people's theories and other people's conclusions. So it's very, very important that there is a 3% dispute and that it continues to live and that those people in the 3% continue to hold the 97% accountable. But what I, I don't enjoy seeing happening is for this to be turned into, um, as I said earlier, a contest of equally valid opinions because that's just not how it is. Okay, the last thing I want to say about the science to give you um, a degree of reassurance is that one of my favorite quotes 
about the science of climate change actually comes from someone who's not a climate scientist. It comes from the uh, pollster, Nate Silver, who wrote a book a number of years ago called the Sing Signal and the Noise. And what he said was that the science of climate change is not rocket science, it actually predates the toaster oven. And that's very important for us to put into perspective what we know about the climate system, because it's actually relatively straightforward. It is about heat and light bouncing and either going back into space or being trapped. And you can go back to the early 19th century for the first discovery of the greenhouse gas effect, and you can see that over the course of time, what has happened in close to 200 years is a gradual accumulation of scientific fact. So this was not unlike the internet, this was not discovered by Al Gore. He happened to make a really good movie about it, but he is not the basis of this. So if there are people out there who don't like climate change because they're not a fan of Al Gore, it's not his fault. You can blame a Frenchman, then you can blame an Irishman, then you can blame a Swede, and then you can blame a Brit, and then you can get into the Americans over here who did an awful lot of this as well. But this is science over decades, conducted in different parts of the world, by different types of scientists, climatologists, oceanographers, healthcare professionals, economists, by different nationalities, all coming to the same conclusion through a competitive process. Okay, so now I want to talk about what we go and do about this once we know the risks and the strategies for resilience. And what we go and do about this starts with the Paris Agreement. And this was adopted by 196 countries at a two-week summit in the French capital in 2015, but is the result of 25 years of painstaking negotiations. The first steps towards the Paris Agreement were taken at the Rio Earth Summit in 1992. And over the course of 25 years, with many steps forward and many steps back, governments came together on a yearly basis to negotiate in a painstaking fashion an agreement that all could live with. And what they finally landed on was the Paris Agreement. And there are a number of important components to this. The first is they've established a global temperature goal of holding temperature rises to two degrees Celsius or less. The reason they've done that is because the science tells us that once we go above two degrees Celsius, above pre-industrial levels, we begin to see, quote, dangerous climate change. Now, we're already seeing climate impacts, but dangerous climate change means the breakdown of all the coral reef systems. It means our basic food crops, wheat, maize, corn, and rice, are no longer able to grow. It means mass migrations. 50 million Bangladeshis who are all Muslim, living on land less than a meter above sea level, having to move into the northeastern part of India, which is Hindu, and which has a history of intercommunal violence between Hindus and Muslims. This is what dangerous climate change looks like. That's what we're trying to avoid. And in order to avoid two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, we are committing to decarbonizing the global economy by the middle of this century. That means drastically reducing the amount of greenhouse gases that we produce, and also building the capacities of natural sinks to absorb more greenhouse gases, our forests, our land, and our oceans. Now that's broken down into different obligations, commitments, and efforts by different governments all around the world. In the case of the United States, there was a commitment to 28% emissions reductions over 2005 levels by the middle of the next decade. In the case of Vermont and California, they've decided to go further, 40% emissions reductions. The European Union, 40% emissions reductions. In the case of China, they have put in place a target of 20% renewable energy by 2030, which is the equivalent of all electricity generation in the United States today. So right around the world, 196 countries, all on their own, domestically putting in place their own targets and then agreeing on mechanisms to hold each other accountable through the Paris Agreement. The second thing that Paris does is that it agrees to mobilize finance in support of all of the activity we will need in order to decarbonize. Some of that money is public money that will be transferred from rich countries to poorer countries to help them with the right sorts of renewable energy and technology and some of it is money to leverage private sector capital so that we get to trillions of dollars of investments and not just billions of dollars. And then finally, there's a goal on resilience. How do we understand the risks we're facing and how do we build the capacity of vulnerable populations to become adaptive in the face of a changing climate? Now, I always say again, three words, I'm afraid. Yeah, please. I was just wondering about the... Um, so, 
the United States saying 28%, and China saying 20%, and this kind of thing. Is there evidence um, that those reductions will actually meet the goal that they set? So there's two things. The first thing is that before the Paris Agreement, we were on course for 4.8 degrees Celsius temperature rises by the end of the century, which puts us into an uninsurable world. As a consequence of what every individual country came to Paris with, the European Union 40%, the US 28%, we deviated from 4.8 degrees Celsius to somewhere closer to 2.8 degrees Celsius, which is still far too high. But what we've got is a process in motion that allows us to progressively increase ambition and over time take away more greenhouse gas emissions through these negotiations. The secret to the success of Paris was that every country came forward with their own best offer. And this is one of the reasons why the, the Trump argument on the Paris Agreement needs to be debunked. There is no issue of the US not getting a fair deal because the US constructed its own deal. The US came forward with its own commitment and said, this is what we think we can do. And if we do it earlier than expected, then we'll talk to you again about increasing our ambition. And if we run into difficulties, we'll have to have another type of conversation. But all of those different offers were made by each domestic country uh, to the Paris Agreement. Now, the way in which we monitor the action that countries are taking is that there is a review mechanism built into the Paris Agreement that allows us to track and monitor what countries are doing in terms of domestic policy, to align that with our understanding of the climate system and how much GHGs need to be taken out of the atmosphere, and to have these regular meetings, like the one I'm going to in two weeks, in order to say to somebody like China, you committed to X, but you're not doing it, what are we going to do now over the course of the next year? So there is a mechanism in place, but it's not a punitive mechanism. There's no sanction against China or the United States or anybody else for failing to live up to its obligation. But the reality is there's no need for a sanction. I got a question recently, somebody in the audience said to me, how can we trust that the Chinese will do what they say they're going to do? And my answer was, they're not doing this for you. They're doing this for them. They're doing it because all of their water is dependent on glacial melt. They're doing it because all of their agriculture is susceptible to drought. They're doing it because all of their manufacturing hubs are within five miles of the coast. They're doing it because they're being exposed to extreme weather events that they weren't previously exposed to. They're doing it because 300,000 Chinese die every year from pollution. And the Communist Party knows that the one big threat to its long-term grip on power is social instability in China. And they're doing it because they're smart enough to realize that seizing the global market on renewable energy makes you the energy superpower of the 21st century. So the reality is none of these other countries need to be told that they ought to be doing all of this. They're doing it because of risk and opportunity. And the great unfortunate um, fake news that is spread is that they will only do this if the US forces them to do it. They don't care, number one. And number two, this is not an unfair deal because everybody kept got the opportunity to, uh, to join a potluck dinner and bring whatever you want to bring. So, three words, unprecedented, defining, and immediate, are the words to use to describe the Paris Agreement. And the reason why I say it's unprecedented is because there has never been before a global deal that covers all these countries. Look at this over here. Every country in the world, with the exception of Syria and the United States, Nicaragua joined last week. Syria has a pretty good reason for why they couldn't join. The only isolated country in the world on this issue right now, the United States. So this is unprecedented in terms of the volume of participation from countries around the globe, and it's unprecedented because of what they are offering to do in terms of taking emissions out of the atmosphere and changing the fundamental structure of their economic model. As I said earlier, 20% of all energy in China will be from renewable sources. In order to get to that, they are mobilizing the financial modern equivalent of the Marshall Plan, which reconstructed Europe after the Second World War. They're putting real money and real infrastructure and real political capital behind this, and that's being repeated right around the globe. The reason why I say it's defining is because, as I mentioned earlier, this is also an economic stimulus. An estimate of the Paris Agreement has suggested that there are $13.5 trillion of new investments in clean energy alone over the course of the next 15 years as a consequence of implementing 
the Paris Agreement. Who's going to seize that $13.5 trillion? Where are those clean energy jobs going to be created? Is it going to be in China or the United States? Well, now it looks more likely to be in China. And that's just for clean energy. But the Paris Agreement also includes transport. And we've seen countries like the UK and India and France come out with announcements saying that by 2040 they will not allow internal combustion engines on their roads anymore. We've seen a company like Volvo come out and say they will not produce internal combustion engines anymore. So transport, you have an order of magnitude of finance and technology being mobilized. Land use, the same. So we're talking about a totally different global economy being created as a consequence of what we're seeing emerging from the Paris Agreement. And like anything, there are going to be winners and losers. And it's very, very important in this regard to be a winner. Now that brings us to our friend in the White House. Um, it used to be, many years ago, when people would ask me, um, what's going on in the United States on climate? Under President Bush, for example, or even under President Obama. And I would always say to them, this is not about Republican or Democrat. This is not about ideology, this is about geology. That was the answer I could always give with a straight face and maintain my integrity, because it was true. There were Democrats right across the country in the Rust Belt, in coal states, coming from states that were dependent on fossil fuels, that were opposed to climate action, and there were moderate progressive Republicans right around the country who were in favor of climate action. Some years ago, Newt Gingrich made an ad with Nancy Pelosi in favor of this issue. Jeb Bush was in favor of this issue. There were all manner of people on either side for and against. So me saying this is not a partisan issue was perfectly reasonable at the time. It's no longer perfectly reasonable. The Republican Party has lost its mind on this issue, unfortunately. And the reason it's lost its mind is because it has become a party that is divorced from facts on this issue and on many more, and it has become too swayed by a limited number of financial contributors who are extremely influential within the party. About four months ago, I was asked to do a strategy for a major philanthropic organization to start building a conservative constituency on this issue in the United States again. And the goal was to see, could we move a limited number of Republicans in the House and a limited number of Republicans in the Senate to become more open on this issue? And one of the things we did was we trained a presidential candidate from the Republican Party from the last cycle. We sent a series of scientists in to speak to him. And over the course of many hours, he asked them over 100 questions on the issue, good and bad. And by the end of the session, he said, I've got it now. I understand. I see that this is real. I see that it's important. And the scientist said to them, well, does that mean you're going to come out and speak about this issue more often? And are you going to be progressive around policy? And his answer was, absolutely not. And they said, well, why? And he said, because I have no constituency on this issue. And the second thing he said was, every time one of us comes out and speaks on this issue, every time we step out on the branch, you shake the tree from under us. And there's two things that come across from that comment. The first is, his political calculus is exactly right. He does not have a constituency on this issue within his own party. And if he does come out and speak publicly about this issue, there will be lots of liberals and Democrats ready to tell him you're a flip-flopper, you're not being genuine, where were you when you needed us? So he has no constituency, and he has only risk if he comes out and speaks on this issue. So the first thing is his calculus is correct. But the second thing is he has nothing but political cowardice. Because it's not just a job of a politician to get elected, it's a job of a politician to lead and to come out and speak to their constituency and to put forward a viewpoint and to run on that viewpoint and to be willing to lose on that viewpoint. And unfortunately, this particular man is emblematic of the type of politics we have right now, where the tendency is to appeal to the base and not to cooperate and not to reach beyond. And that is really problematic. I'm going to let you in in a second, but the second thing that we revealed in that particular uh, piece of work was that in each of these constituencies that we looked at, there was actually a very, very small number of companies and of donors that are responsible for getting our politics moving and getting our elected representatives into office. We were able to identify a small list of 10 companies only and if you were able to change those companies' viewpoints on this issue, and if you were able to persuade them to put their campaign finance only exclusively into candidates who were willing to support this issue, you would change the dynamic of the conversation entirely. 
And some of these companies are very active and progressive on the issue of climate change with their own work. Some of them are amongst the leading companies in the world on climate change. But what they will not do is they will not upset a politician that they're also dependent upon for corporate tax or for cyber security or for net neutrality or for a whole range of other political issues. So what we have is a deadlock. And what that deadlock reveals is you cannot solve climate change if you don't first solve politics. We've got to tackle the two issues together. Otherwise, what we're left with is a laundry list of solutions with the lack of political capital to actually make them a reality. Please. Can you name this legislator? Can I name the legislator? Well, yeah. he was a presidential candidate. Oh. Is that the one you're talking about? Yes. Yeah. Yes, he was, he was a candidate for president in the last cycle. So he didn't win. That leaves you with 16. He is a man, that leaves you with 15, okay. and then you have to work out for the rest. <laughs> now, the last thing I will say about this before I move on is when the President announced that he was withdrawing from the Paris Agreement, what that announcement masked, what it covered, was a broader assault on the issue of climate change within the US. Because as part of my work over the course of the last number of months, I conducted an analysis of various activities that his administration is doing, and I divided it into three categories again, diplomacy, discourse, and decarbonization. And what was revealed is that across those three different categories, there is a sustained assault on climate as an issue. So for example, just last week, the Environmental Protection Agency removed the word climate from a web page that is about climate resilience, and now it's called energy. But the word climate has been completely expunged. On the issue of decarbonization, he's obviously undermined the Clean Power Plan. He's undermined CAFE standards within transportation. He's looked at opening up uh, federal land to uh, oil and gas. And on the issue of diplomacy, he's obviously not only withdrawn from the Paris Agreement, but far more importantly, he has sent a budget proposal to Congress that removes any financing for climate. He's also threatened, of course, the livelihoods of people working in the federal administration across a whole series of different departments with being fired if they work on the issue of climate or if they name climate in any reports. Now, unfortunately, it does not begin and end with uh, Mr. President Trump because, so interestingly, the governor of Florida, Mr. Scott, is a climate denier who won't even allow the term climate change used in meetings, let alone written in reports, and yet when the hurricane goes through Florida, He's up in Washington asking for disaster relief. President Trump owns a golf course in Ireland, and recently he filed to get financial support from the Irish government because part of his golf course is eroding. And the grounds that he used in asking the Irish government for financial support was, climate change is threatening my golf course. So when it comes to asking other governments for money, he's willing to do it. But when it comes to policies, unfortunately, at the national level, he's not prepared to act. And that means that the mantle of leadership in the United States on this particular issue inevitably passes to companies, states, and cities. And it's incredibly important that over the course of the coming years that we see activist governors, activist mayors, and activist populations on this issue. There are some examples. Governor Scott in Vermont has put in place a target of 40% emissions reductions. And it's very important that he does that, but it's also very important that he takes on the mantle of being a moderate, sensible voice on this issue in a party that has lost its mind on this issue. It's very important more than anything else over the coming years that we recreate in this country a sense of bipartisan support. It is possible. President Roosevelt created the National Park System. President Nixon created the Environmental Protection Agency. And it was the first President Bush that signed up to and initiated the negotiations that resulted in the Paris Agreement. So there is a long track record, track record of Republican leadership on this issue, if only they can rediscover it. In order for them to rediscover it, it's going to be very important for Democrats and liberals to allow them into the space, to not use climate change as a point of contention, a point of dispute between the two parties, but to actually begin to forge a consensus on this issue that allows them into the space. Okay final part of the conversation, and that is what can you actually do? I have this horrible habit of always landing on three, but anyway. So the three things that I'm suggesting that you can do are act, enable, and influence. And what act means is 
to pursue in your own life, in your own choices, your own consumption, a low carbon path. And I'm going to give a specific example in just a moment on what you can do with regards to food. But it means understanding where your emissions come from, understanding where your underlying vulnerabilities are, and beginning to correct both. It's about your own action. The second thing is that you need to work to enable other people. It is crucially important that this issue becomes well known and uncontroversial. It is crucially important that people become educated and mobilized on this issue. And that means taking on the responsibility of being leaders and agents of change in our households, in the conversations we have at home, in our workplaces, and of course in community forum. And then the final thing that we need to do is we need to work on influence. The two most important powers people have, the power of the vote and the power of the purse. One of the things that really struck and pained me during the course of the last year, two things, I spent the first part of my career working for the European Union, so Brexit was not a happy day. And the second thing, of course, was the election of, of President Trump. And the day after President Trump was elected, there was a march outside my office in Manhattan in Union Square with people carrying placards saying, he's not my president. And a poll was conducted of these people, and the poll revealed that 54% of those demonstrating had not even voted. And you might recall a clip from President Obama at the Democratic Convention where he mentions the name Trump and the audience starts to boo. And his immediate reaction was, don't boo, vote. Too few people in this country vote. It is shocking to me, as a foreigner, how few people exercise their right to vote in this country. Now, I know there are very legitimate reasons why, if you're a Republican in California, you don't think there's a benefit in voting, and if you're a Democrat in Texas, you think that the vote is probably a waste of time. So I know that there are institutional, structural, constitutional problems behind it. But the reality is, right across every level of governance, right across states, people are not using their voice on this issue. When I go to Capitol Hill, I'm told by the people I meet, that we're always visited by biz bi big business, but we very rarely get visits from people in the environmental movement. And when they do visit us, they don't come here professionally, they don't come here with something tangible to ask for, they're not ready for the meeting. We have to learn how to be influential in politics, because it really matters. And then second of all, we have to use the power of the purse. Companies are moving on this issue, and the reason why they're moving on this issue is because of pressure coming from their shareholders, Pressure is coming from government, reputational risk, climate risk being understood, but also because consumers are demanding different types of goods and services. Walmart is a very good example of this. Walmart is now one of the leading companies in the world on climate change with a very substantial commitment to reduce its emissions right across its supply chain. But how many of you ever step into a Walmart store and find any literature on climate change or any effort to mobilize or educate consumers at Walmart on this issue? Think of the people who shop at Walmart. Think of the people who work there, largest private sector employer in the world. Think of what you would have if those people were mobilized on this issue. Think of how many people within that spectrum of workers and shoppers at Walmart vote for candidates in either party who are not supportive of this agenda. So it's very important to use your power as a person. Yes, please. On that note, can you share with us, is Walmart one of the 10, and what are the other 10 companies that you were referring to before? Because that's a good way to start pushing and pressuring and educating. Walmart was the number one company because consistency, consistently what you find is that Walmart across at least these particular districts, not uniform of course, but across these particular districts, was the largest single employer in the district. Um, in many cases it was a source of corporate um, campaign contributions. In other cases it was the Walton family who had been sources of contributions. Another company in there, for example, was, was Dow Chemical, um, who, again, have more recently been quite progressive on this particular issue, but when it comes to actually influencing politics, tend to take a step back and tend to prioritize other, other issues uh, far higher on the agenda than this particular one. And then, of course, you get into specific individuals. You get into the, the Koch brothers. Um, and if there's one book that I could recommend that anyone take from the library or buy at a bookstore, it's a book called Dark Money, recently published. And it, it really, I think, at least from my experience, gives a, a very, very deep, but also very credible insight into the world of politics. My last visit to Washington, I had a meeting with 15 different representatives from both parties. And there was one representative in particular who 
who kept suggesting that he would like to speak to me on this issue, and at a certain point said, I can speak to you about this issue, but not here. We have to go to the Starbucks across the street. And I was thinking to myself, well, why can't we speak in your office? Why do we have to go to the Starbucks across the street? And it's because you cannot solicit campaign contributions under the dome of the Capitol. But if you go outside the dome of the Capitol, you can solicit campaign contributions. So once we got to the Starbucks across the street, his approach was, these are the people giving me money. If you replace that money with different types of money, I'd be happy to move on this issue. Now, in some countries, that would be called corruption. But in this country, the reality is, if you want to be elected a senator, or if you want to be elected president, you simply have to raise millions, if not billions, of dollars in order for this to happen. And every representative I talk to, without exception, will complain about how many hours they have to spend on the phone trying to raise money, and how humiliating it is for them to have to do this as part of their day-to-day -day job. But it's a reality, again, of the system that we've created that they have to do that. So, Unfortunately, there's some hard choices we have to face. Do we want to go up against those types of people with the same sort of weapons in our armory, or do we want to come up with a new approach? Uh, campaign finance reform, of course, is stalled. But this is a very, very difficult issue. I think, I saw you were about to say something, was that right? Well, and I'll come back to you. Well, Walmart is Walton K through 12, that horrible education system that I wouldn't be caught dead walking into a Walmart store. So. Screw them. And, um... Gina, speak up. <laughs> so we can, I can't even hear you down Oh, here. sorry. No, Walton, Walmart, K through 12. They're responsible for horrible education. Why would I support them? I wouldn't even want to talk to them. And then um, the vote with the gerrymandering. That's got to be gotten rid of. So, I mean, I think the vote is totally illegitimate. We're not in a democracy anyway. It's been interesting to watch this debate uh, of late. Uh, there was one person who said, well, the Founding Fathers did not intend this to be a democracy. They intended it to be a republic, which is just a remarkable answer for somebody to come back with. Uh, on your first point, um, I don't have the luxury in my day-to-day -day life of only working with people who are pure. Because if I want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and I want to solve the climate crisis, I have to go where the emissions are. Just like if I want to solve the issue of inequality, I have to go where the inequality is. If I want to solve social injustice, I have to tackle the people who are causing it. So I have to work with every government on the planet, irrespective of who they are. And I have to work with every company on the planet, irrespective of who they are. Because that's the only way to solve the problem. So someone like Walmart is dreadful on social issues. Dreadful on the living wage. Dreadful on education. It's an absolute disgrace that somebody working at Walmart has to get food from a food drive in order to be able to have a meal when they go home as opposed to being paid a living wage. But the reality is when it comes to climate change, they are one of the best and not only that, they're one of the most influential because one of the things they've decided to do recently is compel all their top 100 suppliers to go low carbon themselves as a condition of doing business with Walmart. So. This problem exists all over the place. I mean, Tim mentioned earlier that I used to work for the Maldives. The Maldives was a country that, um, on the day I resigned from the Maldives, there was a young girl and a young man of 23 years old. They were both convicted of unlawful sex, which means sex before they were married. She was given 100 lashings, he was given 100 lashings. She was imprisoned on her own island for a year, and he was banished from his home island for a year. And the same day, a group of five men were convicted of breaking into a 12-year-old's home and gang raping her. And they were only given 10 lashes each. I had to deal with a government and work for a government that was very progressive on climate, but very regressive on these issues. And if I worked for the US government, there would be things that I would be proud of, and then there would be the death penalty that I would have a huge problem of conscious working. So my point is, if we're going to solve these problems, we've got to focus on the outcome. We've got to focus on what it is we're trying to achieve and we've got to be willing to work with people we don't agree with and that we might even find detestable because it's the only way to succeed. Sir. I just had I, I, just a question. By the way, my, these pants came from Walmart and, they, and it cost me $12. <laughs> um, but my question is, does Walmart, um, adver when they advertise, do they, do they tout their climate change in their advertising. I'm just curious if that plays well at all with their, with their customers. They don't. That's one of the problems that I have with them. And they're not the only problem. Um, Ikea, for example, has 40 million customers coming into an Ikea shop 
shops every single week. And IKEA does wonderful work on climate change. But they don't mobilize what I call their captive audience, their customers. They don't educate them and they don't mobilize them. And that's a serious, serious problem and that they we need to address. They don't brag about their, they, they don't tout it because it won't play well. It won't play well. And the reason it won't play well is because um, this has become a tribal issue. I would say that there are politics and then there's tribalism. And in the United States, unfortunately, things have become quite tribal. And we now disagree with each other for the sake of disagreeing. We now disagree with each other because I'm part of one tribe, you're part of another, and we must therefore disagree. And that's terribly corrosive to our social structure and very corrosive to our politics, and we've got to get over that. And the reason why a Walmart, for example, will not come out and say things about this issue is because they're very, very frightened of scaring away a consumer base that is a little bit more red meat than the liberals who like climate change. Now, there's one um, potential uh, saving grace in all of this, and that is that when the Walmart CEO decided to announce their climate commitments last November, he didn't announce it at a food conference, he didn't announce it as a, at a retailer conference, he announced it at something called Net Impact, which is an internet conference populated by millennials. And the reason he did that is because he's smart enough to see that his consumer base is dying off. They're getting older, the shoppers at Walmart. And he knows that his company can only succeed if it attracts millennials. And millennials care about this issue. So he made a strategic decision to go to this conference and announce it at a place where he knew there would be millennials in order to reach that constituency. Now what we have got to reflect back to him, and in this case I don't mean we millennials because I'm not a millennial, is we've got to reflect back to him that climate leadership is no longer emissions reductions. Climate leadership now in 2017 is about being activist and vocal on this issue. And if you're not willing to do that, if you're not willing to challenge the politics of this issue, then you're not, in my book, any more considered a climate leader. Please. You probably know this, the, uh, the um, governor has asked the Vermont Climate Action Commission, 25 or 26 people, to conduct hearings, and he's, he's had four hearings. I went to three, of them, by the way. But he said he will, he wants to adopt three recommendations, mm -hmm. three action plans, whatever, as long as they improve the economy and don't hurt the economy. Is that contradictory? I don't think it's contradictory, though. And, and I'll tell you why. There's, there's data that I could show you, if I had brought the right slide, that shows the countries over the course of the last 15 years that have been most ambitious on reducing emissions and how their economy has grown at the same time and they have had substantial growth. So you can couple economic prosperity with decarbonization. It's really just about switching to different types, different fuel mix and different fuel use. So it's incumbent on those 25 people to present it in such a way that he understands whatever we recommend, and hopefully they will recommend three yep. things that will, in fact, improve the economy. Right. Now, what would those three, three, three things be that you would recommend? The first thing I would say is that I've spoken to this commission, and what I said to them as a starting point was, you've got to sell this as an opportunity and not an exercise in burden sharing. And what I meant by that is, there are thousands of companies around the wor world now who have taken on board a commitment to go 100% renewable energy, 100%. And many of those companies cannot honor that commitment because they are confronted with a monopoly energy provider that will only give them fossil fuels. So what has the government of Quebec done? Quebec has gone around to these different companies and said, you have your data center right now in Oklahoma. They won't give you <coughs> renewable energy. Come to Quebec, put your data center in Quebec, and we will give you the renewable energy that you need. And these companies are now beginning to have those conversations. So the first thing is, you can create economic opportunity by putting in place the right sorts of enabling conditions to reduce uh, em emissions if you target these sorts of companies to move into your jurisdiction. And as a consequence, you can raise revenue as you are tackling the emissions reductions. My own personal view is the most important uh, policy to put in place, but it has to be designed properly, is a carbon price. Now there are poor carbon prices and there are very successful carbon prices, depending on how you design them. The word carbon price 
it's a vacuous word because it means lots of things. It means an emissions trading system and it means a tax. It means consumers paying more or it means rebates to consumers so that they don't have to pay more. It's really a question of how you design it. But I think a well-designed carbon price in, in Vermont could drive down emissions, could provide social protection to low-income populations so that they don't have to pay more money for their, for their energy, and could provide additional revenue to the state that they could use on economic development. And number three? Well, the carbon pricing is only one, actually. I put in place a carbon price. Well, the first um, one was to actually reduce emissions. Yeah. Well, the carbon price is how you reduce the emissions. Okay, okay that's So I, I would say the carbon price is the number one thing. Uh, the second thing that I would do, I suppose, is what I said earlier, which is I would brand Vermont as a low, low emission state. And I would actively pursue these companies who are looking at relocation decisions right now. I would actually actively pursue them to try and move into the state. And the third thing that I would do is to focus on resilience. Because in Vermont, the, the big problems in Vermont are what will happen to fall foliage as a consequence of climate change, what will happen to ski season as a consequence of climate change? And most recently, what is happening to people's livelihoods as a consequence of Lyme's disease and ticks? Um, I was at the medical center a couple of days ago. They tell me they get 10 calls a day about this. So what we're seeing is the growing season for ticks uh, lengthened as a consequence of shortened winters. And we're seeing the spread of the disease in places that hadn't previously had it, including up over the border into Canada. So I think there needs to be a focus on resilience in, in Vermont and not just on, on, carbon, on, on uh, greenhouse gas emissions reductions. I actually think the Vermont approach is quite good, to be perfectly honest, because when I look across the water at New Hampshire, when Trump pulled out of the Paris Agreement, Governor Sununu's response was, well, I haven't given this much thought. And my response to that is, if you haven't given much thought to what the economic profile of your state looks like for the rest of this decade, of what risks are threatening the livelihoods and industries in your state for the next decade, and of the consequences of all of these things that I mentioned earlier, vector-borne diseases, ski season, and so on, then you're negligent as governor of the state. So I actually think that what's happening in Vermont right now is, is relatively progressive, and also especially when you think that it's being done by a Republican administration. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, let me wrap up and then we can go to more questions. This is, this is really what I wanted to leave you with in terms of uh, things that you can do. The first thing that I think it's very, very important for you to do as an individual is to understand your own carbon footprint. And you can use various online tools to help you get a sense as to what your carbon footprint is. It's going to be a mixture of things. It's going to be your home. It's going to be your electricity use. It's going to be your transportation. It's going to be your diet. But the weighting across those different things are very different for each individual. For example, I have a very high carbon footprint because I fly all over the world to these meetings. So my carbon footprint is probably about 40 tons per year, far above average. But until about two months ago, I never owned a car in my life. And I always lived in small properties. And I always ate local food, etc. So my carbon footprint looks one way, your carbon footprint looks another way. The first thing is understand your carbon footprint, because that will give you an understanding as to what you can begin to do to reduce your emissions. You can, of course, start by thinking about your transport modalities, whether you can use public transport, whether you can use bikes, whether you can do more car pooling, whether you can buy a car with better miles per gallon, whether you can buy an electric car. There are many, many things you can do. You can obviously source your consumption locally so that the goods and services you buy are not embedded with emissions as a consequence of having to travel large distances from overseas. So stop buying French mineral water. Stop buying flowers that are grown in Kenya. You can buy stuff locally that will have a smaller carbon footprint relative to the ones that you normally buy. And of course, think about your home. Think about how you power your home, what sources of energy you use, but also think about energy consumption. Energy efficiency is increasingly being called the new source of energy because so much of our energy is wasted from transmission to final use. We have outdated energy infrastructure, which means most of the energy is wasted before it even gets to your socket. And then, of course, we overconsume electricity by keeping the thermostat too high when it doesn't need to be, by having uh, electronic devices on when they don't need to be, etc. So really think about energy efficiency. But something that's very dynamic that people need to be thinking of increasingly is really about your diet, the type of food that you eat, and the amount of food that you waste. So recently, I organized an event which was called, What Are You Prepared to Do for the Climate? And it featured a 
brilliant speaker talking about the emissions that come from various food sources, and a wonderful chef behind him cooking an elaborate meal. And the chef was actually con uh, constructing a meal based entirely on insect protein. And everyone was then invited to try it. Are you willing to push your boundaries and try something different for the client? And what we realized, of course, was that you can get the same, if not better, amounts of nutrition and protein for far less environmental footprint by shifting your diet. Now, I'm not suggesting that we live in caves and that we all consume insects. I'm simply saying we need to do a better job of diagnosing our behavior so that we can understand our options. The first option is that we need to cut down on the amount of waste that is produced. Huge volumes of food waste in restaurants, huge volumes of food waste as a consequence of not getting crops from farm to fork quickly enough, huge volumes of waste, of course, as a consequence of food being unsold within supermarkets. So we really have to tackle that issue of food waste, but we also have to tackle the issue of consumption. And one of the things, if you look at food, is that a very, very dominant source of greenhouse gas emissions, and the number one thing you can do to reduce your own footprint is cut back on your beef. Beef is a huge production of methane, which has far more deadly consequences for the climate than CO2 emissions. The production of beef uses enormous amounts of water, and of course it requires enormous amounts of crops to feed the cattle, and it requires larger amounts of land. So if you were to simply switch more of your beef to pork, for example, you would already make huge inroads into your carbon footprint. If you were to switch from pork to chicken or turkey, you would again make huge inroads into your carbon footprint. So just think about that. Think about your balance. You don't have to go vegetarian. You don't have to eat insects. But there are choices that you can make once you become more informed about your footprint and once you become more informed about your options that will lead to a substantially lower greenhouse gas emissions profile. I'll take here and the back. And, and when you're making those statements with regards to beef versus pork versus chicken, et cetera, are you speaking to typical industrial ag operations? And where do more sustainable, you know, grass-fed, pasture-fed, local beef, where does that fit in? Is, does that does that bring you down significantly from the 83%? Uh, it would not bring you down significantly. So yes, absolutely. Industrialized ranching is far more carbon intense because of the inputs that go into that than a small holder, um, a small holder property uh, somewhere in Vermont, for example. So yes, absolutely. These are general principles that, generally speaking, the production of beef is incredibly damaging to the environment. In fact, I read recently a statistic that said if beef alone was a country, it would be one of the top 20 emitters in the world because of the amount of natural resources that go into growing, everything that's needed to feed the cattle, because of all of the greenhouse gases the cattle themselves produce, because of the shipment along the supply chain of the meat, because of the waste of meat, and because of the consumption of it. So these are broad principles, but it, it really, really is quite significant. I've worked on this issue for 21 years, and when I saw this research on this graphic a couple of weeks ago, I, I myself was actually quite stunned because it's, it's really striking. It's not a small deviation between them, it's really, really striking. And I come from a country where um, red meat is something that you consume three times a day. So for me to see that graphically illustrated was really actually quite a cultural shock as well as quite a scientific shock. Okay, this is the last slide and then I promise to be... Yes? So just a real short question and then I, or, or a story and I have a question. Yes. When I was 30, I was told to cut out red meat because of my cholesterol and whatnot. So I did. Mm -hmm. So I haven't had a hamburger or now and then a filet mignon, whatever. About five or about ten years ago I met a woman who actually was into raw vegetables and I thought, what kind of weird diet is that? Well you know what? I, I tried it and I lost twenty six pounds. Wow. Now more recently, so I get my protein basically from a milkshake, because I'm pre diabetic and I have to lose weight. So I've lost twenty seven pounds in the last six weeks, six six months. But the, the question I have is, if we were to switch completely from meat to vegetable or insect protein, by the way, crickets are not bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they say that you, you would be using so much land you, could, you wouldn't have room for the, for the soy or whatever, corn, whatever. So it, what, what's the argument against that argument, that switching from beef to vegetables and the land, um, land use uh, situation? 
So the first thing I would say that after everything I've babbled on about for the last hour and a half, please don't leave this room thinking that I'm advocating that you eat insects. That's, that's, the, one, that's the one message that you take away. The climate, the climate action agenda is doomed for all time. The cricket energy bars are not bad. <laughs> exactly. So I, I think one of the things I've learned is that there are trade-offs to everything when it comes to public policy. There are always trade-offs. There are going to be winners and losers. Uh, there are going to be losers in energy, and the losers are going to be people who are producing coal. It's inevitable. So there's no easy solution. There's no easy answer. I mean, you're, you're raising a very important point about land use. We're seeing right around the world a growth in the global middle class. And as the middle class grows, they switch from a predominantly vegetarian diet, and they eat more seafood, and they eat more beef. So in a sense, our efforts to reduce beef consumption are going against the grain because of this change in demographics. But it still has to be done. Now, one of the ways you can do that is you can reduce the volume that we consume, because we consume far too much. In parts of the world, the problem that we have with food is insufficient amounts. In the rich world, what we have is a problem of obesity and consumption of far too much food. So we can, we can address that. The second thing we can do is we can be more, far more efficient in our use of land, in our use of water, and we've seen efficiency gains and yield gains substantially over the course of the last four decades. Why I'm saying we need to get an understanding of trade-offs is because one of the real difficulties we have right now in climate is the need to get off fossil fuels, but our distaste of nuclear. And one of the other major problems we have is the need to tackle land, but our distaste of GMOs, genetically modified organisms. There are arguments against GMOs, very strong arguments. There are also arguments in favor of GMOs. You can produce far more with far less to feed far more. So one of the things we've got to get comfortable with, I think, is complexity, because complexity will enable us to make those choices between those different alternatives and then implement the right policy approaches. If we were to switch entirely off one source of food to another, we'd simply end up with a poor balance in the opposite direction. So we, we've got to try a way of, find a way of balancing this, and we've got to try and find a way of having really difficult conversations. I think you might have been at the Burr and Burton meeting of the Climate Commission. Is that right? Did you go to that in Manchester? And so if you were there, you would have heard a gentleman stand up and say, climate change is not a problem. I'll tell you what the problem is, it's population. And there probably were some people in the audience who snickered and thought, what the hell is this guy doing talking about population in the climate meeting? Again, there's a grain of truth in what he said. When I was born in 1975, we had 3 billion people on the planet. Now we have 7 billion, soon we'll have 10 billion. There is absolutely no doubt that more population leads to more natural resource use. So we've got to be able to have that conversation, a difficult conversation, that does involve private decisions made on it by individuals if we're going to begin to address these sorts of issues. We've got to be able to have that. Because the reality is, there are no simple solutions. Please, and then here. Um, should I use my microphone? Uh, well, uh, I, I thought that your, your comment about tribalism is really important. Um, that's something I kind of study. I really look at how difficult it is. Even sometimes, even talk about, you know, there are sub tribal units too. We talk about climate change, even with people that are, you, you would assume, are of a similar tribe. But looking at the large disparity in this country, and yeah, that's, that's an amazing phenomenon that's happening. This you know, division where we're separated in our own world. People are always talking about silos or echo chambers. They really do exist. Yeah. And uh, partly result of the media and so forth. Uh, but I just wanted to speak to just one uh, thing, just about Vermont. Um, I moved here from California. I love that Vermont is small. I think Vermont has potential to be a really shining example of what can be done. And some of your uh, suggestions, were, I think, were great for the uh, Climate Committee. Um, uh, so there's the, you know, the Vermont, uh, the um, Volkswagen uh, settlement money that's going to be really interesting to see where that goes. There's the Climate Change Committee. Uh, but there's also, back in, in 1915, uh, 2015, uh, we changed our renewable energy credit uh, uh, composition. And so uh, one of the things that I'm doing, and a lot of people know about this, is something called the bike And what we do is we're trying to redo the bike in, in Vermont. And one of the things that because Vermont has been so, uh, kind of, you know, has, has this forethought about like, you know, how we can change our energy um, equation, 
um, there is uh, this um, uh, provision that we can now, utilities now can get credits by replacing fossil fuels with electricity. Mm -hmm. And so now the Burlington Electric Department and v bike and Local Motion, which is our state uh, alternative transportation agent, uh, 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 kind of bicycle um, uh, group, um, uh, we've uh, made an agreement with uh, the Burlington Electric Department to start uh, uh, supplying subsidies to people that decide to buy electric bikes and cargo bikes and a whole range of technologies that allow us to keep on using our bodies. Because one of the things that we really firmly believe that there's another energy solution it happens to be us, <laughs> and, and we often don't even notice that. It's not even in our energy plan, barely recognized. Sometimes they you know, mention things about you know, active transportation. But we really feel that the human body has to be used because otherwise, if that energy is not used, the consequences are horrible. But so, so I think that Vermont could be a shining example. And this like subsidy program is going to be the first in the United States. There's never been a subsidy program for electric bikes. Like we're you know we're finding these things going on in Sweden, and elsewhere, in Norway. Um, but the other thing that the Burlington Electric Department is going to allocate is uh, ten thousand dollars to develop a, a demonstration fleet. Um, and I just think there are so many wonderful yeah. things that can happen in Vermont, and there's so many different, you know, great ideas. Uh, my my focus is like, how can we make you know Vermont the shining example? Because my God, it is like depressing looking at the tribalism and looking at you know our leaders. Well, I think there's a lot to be said for this issue yeah. of addressing uh, subsidies. Yeah. Um, that was actually a recommendation that I made to the Vermont Climate Commission is to not think of new money as being needed to invest in a clean energy future, but to think about how we re rebalance existing money. Yeah. Because there's a huge amount of money globally spent on subsidizing fossil fuels. Not just in the direct subsidy that's given to companies, but in what's called a post-tax subsidy. When you have to pay for a healthcare system to treat respiratory diseases, that is a subsidy to an industry that is polluting. So the scale of subsidies, both pre-tax and post-tax, are really quite substantial. And so looking into this issue of subsidies to make sure that something like solar power for your home, which right now, let's face it, is pretty much unaffordable for an awful lot, if not most people, the right sorts of mechanisms need to be put in place in order to make that more affordable from a subsidy, a financial standpoint, but also we need to look at the regulations. Uh, we need to look at you know, whether it's right to have a monopoly energy provider that, that has, in some states, the power of God over what type of energy you use, right? So all of these things can be addressed. And I agree with you entirely. I think in terms of the politics, in terms of the natural environment, in terms of the desire and education on this issue, there's an awful lot of, of, of potential for Vermont to be the shining example, but there's an awful lot of opportunity that comes back to Vermont if that is actually piloted. It's not just a moral crusade. Right, right. right. And, and I felt, for example, at the, at the Climate Commission meeting that I attended, I felt too much of it was framed as a moral crusade. There were an awful lot of young students from Bennington College and from Green Mountain College talking about our moral obligation to do this. And I thought, we've got to stop talking about this as a moral issue. We've got to start talking about this as an economic opportunity if we do the right thing and if we get out ahead of the, of the pack. Because that's what China's doing. Yeah. And if China's doing that globally, Vermont can do that domestically. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir, please. Uh, I always get very um, distressed when we talk about climate change and we talk about it in terms of what can individual consumers do. Um, first of all, I think the population issue is big. And it shouldn't just come in as an afterthought. As you say, when I was a kid, there were 2.6 billion people. It's, you know, climate change is kind of fashionable to talk about suddenly because certain corporations and the CIA and the Pentagon have decided that it is a problem after all. It's not just because we think it's a problem. So now it's big, but you know, it's just part. It, it just seems, we're not talking about the military. I mean, we want to cut our emissions, but nobody wants to touch the military and nobody wants to touch population. And so it's like, yeah, I'll change my light bulbs and I'll eat less beef, but I mean, I'm going to shop local. I'm in Vermont anyway, and I'm not going to brag about buying pants at Walmart. I'll bra bra brag about buying pants at the thrift store. But, you know, it, it, it's just that that's 
Our values, our basic way of looking at other species and at the earth, we lost our way so long ago. Thousands of years ago, probably, but I'm just saying, it's like when you see the water protectors at Standing Rock and what they're saying, how dear they are trying to live with Earth, it's so far away from any of the kind of technological and consumer solutions that we talk about in a forum like this. It's like, and I think that it's all doomed unless there's a change in values to where we stop following these desert gods who tell us that we're made in his image, patriarchy, and, and that we're the top of the heap. So is that going to happen in the next 20 years when you stop worshiping? You know, we're going to live gods? in a dystopian, I mean, they'll manage to have solar panels and electric cars in China. <coughs> we'll still have 10 billion people. And there's going to be wars everywhere, and people will be dying everywhere, and they'll be... I, I, I don't know if we're going to solve anything basic. We'll still have plastics in the ocean. We'll still have fisheries in collapse. We may mitigate some things about the, the, the carbon in the atmosphere. That's great. I'm all for that. But I'm just saying, it's like we're, we're trying to put a Band-Aid on, on, on a collapsing human reality that we've brought upon ourselves by our values. And maybe we should start listening to people like at Standing Rock. That's all. So I would have a couple of things to say about this. The first is, if you haven't read it, there's a wonderful book, the title of which is based on a lyric from a Billy Holiday song. And the book is called, The Difficult I Will Do Today, The Impossible Will Take a Little While. Mm -hmm. And it's a very important book because it contains short stories from across a whole range of different types of disciplines. It contains a short story from Nelson Mandela, and a short story from Václav Havel, but also a short story from a woman working on a suicide hotline. And the main theme of the book is, how do we maintain a sense of patience in a time of urgency? Because we are talking about huge problems that are decades, centuries, millennia in the making, and that need to be solved quite quickly. And in order to solve a problem, in my experience, is you first of all need to get started. You second of all need to have a sense of optimism. And thirdly, you need to start tackling the right issues. So I agree with a lot of what you've said about, yes, we need to look at population, and yes, there are many things happening that we need to be concerned about. The oceans are in a dreadful state, and the plastics issue that you mentioned is, is horrendous. And yet, there are good news stories to look at. If you look at the number of people who have been removed from absolute or relative poverty over the last 20 years, it's a human success story unparalleled in history. If you look at the amount of people who are being removed from food insecurity, it is a human success story. So around the world, there are many examples of what we're doing that is in the right direction, as well as many examples of what we're doing that are in the wrong direction. I don't think it's one or the other. I don't think you can solve a societal problem with a technological fix. But I also know that the right sort of societal motivations and incentives often do lead to the right sorts of fixes, including economics and technical and legal and others. A lot of what's coming out of Silicon Valley is corrosive. A lot of what's coming out of it is problematic. But there's also an awful lot of big data analytics that are helping us solve some of these problems. So I, I don't disagree. I would just encourage to have a sense of what is possible in all of this, as well as that sense of, uh, of of foreboding and that sense of problem, because I see this problem on a day-to-day -day basis, and I agree with you that it's real, but I also have the privilege of being able to see some of the solutions that are pioneered, and, and they are also real. They're equally real. <clears throat> when you talk about um, getting people out of poverty, isn't that within the context of capitalism, and um, capitalism just not being sustainable and creating the mess that we're in? has created the mess that we are in. Well, I said at the beginning that there are facts and then there are philosophies. So this is, I think, where we're into philosophies rather than facts. Um, I am neither a capitalist nor a communist nor an anarchist nor an anything elseist. But what I can tell you is that if you look at China, China does not have a communist economy. China has a rampant capitalist economy. Yes, and China have been remarkable over the course of the last decades in taking people out of poverty and in increasing and improving just about every measure that you could have 
on the human health, not the human health index, the human index, with the exception of environmental destruction. There has been great cost to the environment in China as a consequence of their development. But they have developed enormously. And you compare their development with what happened previously under communism and what happened throughout communist countries right around the globe. So I'm a scientist. It's not my job to be a philosopher. It's my job to look at the facts. And I see around the world examples of capitalism in Scandinavia that work perfectly beautifully. They pay high taxes, but for example, I have a PhD. And so from the level of kindergarten, to primary education, to secondary education, to bachelor's degree, to master's degree, to PhD, I never paid a penny. I never got a scholarship, never paid a penny, have no student debt, but my family paid more taxes. Because that was the social contract we had in my country, in a capitalist country. We have free health care where I come from. As an epileptic, it was taken care of throughout my whole life. It's not a communist country, it's a capitalist country. So I would not confuse the type of capitalism you have here on Wall Street with right. the type of capitalism that you have in Scandinavia, with the type of capitalism you have in Germany, with the type of capitalism you have in France, any more than I would confuse communism in China with communism in Vietnam with the type of socialism you have in Venezuela. I just think what we have to do is look at the desired outcomes and figure out how to get there. And if we get there through social democracy or through conservatism, if we get there through humanism or through Hinduism or through Christianity, I don't care. What I care about is these vulnerable populations that I work with around the world on a daily basis, they need a solution. And whatever that solution happens to be, whatever advances their life, I'm in favor of it. Please. Uh, I'm wondering if you could talk about what you see possibilities for Vermont on like a state level, what could happen, because um, you compared it to like Quebec's thing. And my understanding there is they have this, they have the massive hydro thing, which, I don't think we could do here, and also has other problems. I think with what they, the way that that got set up there and everything. But is it? So we're reducing. Uh, I guess what, like, what do you see as actual our energy plants here, or are we getting our power, say, from Quebec or from somewhere else? Is it about like wind power thing? Is it solar power? And, and then is this where you deal with the complexities and say that solar power is gonna just add a whole bunch more plastic into the world that will end up in the oceans and whatever? Or is has to, you have to mine the cobalt or the kids have to mine the cobalt in Africa or whatever it is. I don't know. Unfortunately, it is. I mean, one of the things the Vermont Climate Commission is finding is a huge pushback against the notion of wind power because of the idea of massive wind turbines sitting on top of mountains and impacting other facets of the Vermont economy, as well as impacting intrinsic things of value to individual Vermonters. So. Again, I think when it comes to this issue or any issue, one of the things we've lost in the United States as well as the ability to have conversations with each other in a civil manner is we've lost the ability to think through complexity. It's very difficult to be complex in 140 characters. When your whole civil discourse is based on Twitter, when it's based on soundbite, it's very, very difficult. John Kerry got into all so, so much trouble for saying I voted for it before I voted against it. It's a stupid soundbite, but what he was trying to reveal in that moment was this is a complex issue, as most of the things we deal with are. And unfortunately, when it comes to Vermont, what we have to do first and foremost is we have to understand where the emissions come from. The second thing I would advocate is we have to take a stepwise approach to all of it. There's no need and there's no value in saying it's all an energy problem or it's all a transport problem or it's all an agriculture problem. We have to tackle all of these sources of emissions because you can find that by taking a bite size out of each of those sectors, you can actually get to ambition through an accumulation. And sometimes the mistake that we make is we decide to ignore land use because we don't want to upset the farmers, and we ignore transport because the motor companies have bought all the public transportation companies and shut them down so that we'll all build roads, and instead what we'll do is focus exclusively on energy. 
and that makes the huge bite that we need to take out of energy far, far too difficult and far less palatable. So what I, what I recommend strongly to whomever I work with is what's called a wedges approach. Understand your full emissions and then start to take bite sizes out of each of them because what then happens is people start to feel confident when they succeed. If you can reduce your emissions by 5%, you begin to realize, you know what, that wasn't terribly difficult. I can go to 10%. And we see this with companies all the time. They start with a 20% target, they meet it early, they go immediately to a 30% target. So confidence breeds success. Success then breeds more confidence, which breeds more ambition. And I think that that's the best way to go. But here, there's very complicated issues to resolve because the energy mix is, is difficult. And that's why I always think it's important to look at it also from a, a energy use perspective. What can we do to reduce the amount of energy, first and foremost, that we're using? What can we do to enhance the infrastructure so that less is wasted in transmission? And then we can start having a conversation about what the other types of, of energy in the mix ought to be. Please. Uh, <clears throat> I appreciate the, uh, the concrete examples you've been giving about how we can begin to take steps towards solving these problems, which is so enormous. And I think that's very encouraging and, and practical. I like that. Um, but I'm struck by your, your one, one of the issues that you raised was the tribalism. Mm -hmm. And I think in regard to tribalism, which is, so di which is turning out to be so divisive, it indicates that we need uh, to work a, a very crucial element along with all these practical steps is helping people to uh, approach a change of thinking regarding themselves as being independent indep and not uh, a part of a whole. Mm -hmm. That we need, if, if people begin, can begin to think of, of ourselves as one human tribe, mm -hmm. one human family, and begin to cut across these, these uh, divisions that have sprung up that divide us and, and weaken us as a result because it, it sets the stage for conflict. So, you know, there, you do have to bring in the philosophical a bit yeah. in order to really <clears throat> tackle the problem. And, and I know that there are groups of people who are working on this, toward this end. And I, and I, I applaud them from whatever direction they, they come uh, at this idea of, of building a consensus of, of the human family that we are and how interdependent we are and that, the, that it is a, uh, a basic moral and spiritual issue. And there are you know, the groups that are promoting that, you know, include many religious groups mm -hmm. and also social groups. And wherever it happens, I really hope that people will take some hope and, and confidence that this, this movement toward realizing our global, you know, family and that this planet is, is so interrelated and inter inter interdependent. And, we, and the more that concept comes to the fore, I think we have a better chance of of coming out off the other end. But thank goodness we have both both the practical, scientific, and also the more spiritual and, and high, high thinking through thing uh, aspect. But they both need to work together. I absolutely agree with you. And I think this gentleman made the comment about values. He yeah. used the term yeah. values. Yeah. There is a term that I use in my work, and it's called creating a vocabulary of arguments. And what I mean by that is when I first went to Washington and I had to approach Capitol Hill, I would approach the hill and I would speak about ecology. And I would find that a limited number of people, usually Democrats, would speak to me and the rest would not want to talk. So the next day I went back and I spoke about competitiveness. And a few more people would speak to me than the day before. And the next day I would go back and I would talk about national security. Because the reality is the military is aware of this issue. And John McCain became a supporter of climate action because he was fearful as to where American servicemen would have to go in order to deal with climate related conflict more people would listen to me. The next day I would go and talk about human rights and how climate change undermines the realization of the right to health, minimum means of subsistence, adequate standard of living, the right to food, the right to life. More people would speak to me. The next day I would go and I would speak about faith, stewardship of the land, what the Bible has to say about protection of the common good. More people would talk to me. My point is not a technological fix. My, talk, my point is not science above philosophy. I was simply answering the question by saying, I'm not a capitalist or a communist. What we need to do, however, is we need to understand that what motivates us is not necessarily what motivates someone else. So if I go in to speak to a rabbi or a priest, I need to know that audience. 
so that I can motivate them with what gets them excited and not impose upon them what brought me to this subject. And similarly, if I'm going to go in and speak to the CEO of a major company, there is no point in me going in to speak to that person about an ancient Confucian philosophy. I need to go in and speak to that person about profitability, business continuity, risk management, shareholder value, consumers. You have to create that vocabulary of arguments. Because when we bring all of that together, that's when we have, I think, a chance of success. Uh, let me go here first and then back, yeah. I'm wondering, um, there's a, it seems like in each of those different audiences, though, there, there needs to be a basic receptivity to fact, it sounds like. Can you speak up? Sure. Um, what, I, what I was saying is that it seems like when you're speaking to different audiences, in order for you know, your argument to have an effect, there needs to be a basic receptivity to fact. Mm -hmm. And so along those lines, I'm wondering, you know, you, it sounds like you've been to a bunch of different countries where it's like, have you seen, is there, are there like commonalities in terms of, um, you know, if you're talking to like, a, you know, you're working with a government or, a, you know, different kinds of business or you're working with like a faith group or something, um, have you seen commonalities in terms of being receptive, especially among governments? I would say so. I would say that the commonalities are more a function of the discipline somebody has been trained in. So speaking to a lawyer in China is not that different to speaking to a lawyer in the States. Speaking to an engineer in the Philippines is not that different to speaking to an engineer in Peru. So the disciplinary background they bring, as you just alluded to, the type of organization they work for or are engaged with is important. Um, Again, the, the chief financial officer of a company in China is not that different from a chief financial officer of a company here. So I would say the geographic boundaries are less important quite often than these other types of, of boundaries. Um, I wouldn't like to say it's about choosing your facts because facts are facts. The reality is there's a broad range of facts. There's the scientific facts, there's the economic facts, there's the legal facts in terms of the obligations under the Paris Agreement and so on. So it's not about creating artificial facts, it's about picking the right message for the right audience. It's about using the language that they'll understand. So a very tangible illustration of this is, a lot of climate science looks at what the world will look like in 2100. But the average life expectancy of a CEO in his or her job is six years. So if you go and talk to the CEO of a company about what's going to happen in 2100, his or her answer will be, well, first of all, I'm only here for six years, and second of all, all of my shareholders expect a quarterly report, and in that quarterly report, they expect an increase in profits. So what have you got to tell me about the next quarter? If you go to a politician, their cycle is four years or six years or two years. So speaking to them about what happens in 2100 isn't terribly useful either. So what I'm saying is, I know I've spent an awful lot of time speaking tonight, but probably the most important skill in my job is the ability to listen. Because it's only when you listen that you understand someone else's point of view, and it's only when you listen that you understand, for want of a better term, their pressure points. And then once you know those, you can go back and you can speak to them and you can seek to influence them. I'm in the business of persuasion, the business of influence. You can't influence someone if you don't know them. So there are commonalities, and we try to find the commonalities. But it, it really is about trying to take um, this vocabulary of arguments and break down the different constituencies that you're trying to persuade and working with whatever you think is going to, to win the argument on that particular day. So I have many examples of being at the climate summit and one day I'll be speaking to Hindu, the Hindu, which is the largest newspaper in India, and the next day I might be speaking to the New York Times. The messaging that I use for the journalists for those different papers has to be totally different because they're appealing to different audiences. Yes, please. Uh, well, I want to put a plug in for that wonderful book, The Impossible Table mm -hmm. Tomorrow. It's just like, it, it's right on my bedside. And Great. When I get discouraged, I, you know, I flip that out there, and it's just like, oh, okay, I get it. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, thank you for that. I mean, it's such a, you know, just the title itself. It's great. It's great to bring down the level of uh, anxiety uh, alone. Um, and then, you know, the other side, you know, the, you know what you're talking about, um, or it was like, I totally understand it. it. makes a lot of sense. And there are groups, you know, like it's like deep green resistance. And they're into 
this whole well, this whole project is forget about it and let's find out the nodes that we can uh, work on to actually break it down. So there's like a whole um, movement towards that to look up the deep green resistance. Uh, you know, Derek Jensen, uh, you know, a lot of other folks are involved in that. But it's a whole other way of thinking that um, part of me is like, I get that, you know. Another part of me is like very much in this world, uh, trying to work in this world. Um, you know, the last thing I just say is that on uh, next, uh, uh, Wednesday next week, I'm gonna be offering a just a little brown bag thing over at the River Garden. And it's, a, it's about, um, I, I think I'm calling it, um, it's eco-psychology, uh, the human psyche with the earth in mind. And a lot of it was about like, how do we maintain this kind of, you know, the passion that we have and, not, and really work with the despair that we all have about what's going on. And really the how, you know, the words of wisdom from a lot of uh, different eco-psychologists and philosophers about how we can bring our passion and really make it work in the world and deal with, you know, again, that despair. We're not, well, be like you, but you can speak to you know, a variety of different people and you know, kind of like, okay, I gotta gauge you know, each one, of, you know, for each one of these people. Not all of us can do that. Some of us are really passionate about specific things and working in specific areas. And so, you know, and this uh, you know, brown bag thing is all about like, how to really, uh, you know, energize that as much as but I, I just want to thank you for yeah. your amazing kind of versatility in, in how you work and uh, how you approach uh, folks. Thank you. Um, I, I think perspective in this issue and other issues becomes crucially important. And I've been thinking about this a lot lately as a consequence of uh, President Trump. And as a foreigner, I've been watching how a certain portion of the United States has been reacting to President Trump. And I see amongst people who didn't support him fear of an American president. And I realized, you know, those of us who are from other parts of the world, we know what it's like to be frightened of an American president. Ask the Chileans what it was like to be afraid of Richard Nixon. Ask the Vietnamese what it was like to be afraid of Kennedy and Johnson and Nixon. Ask the Grenadians what it was like to be afraid of Ronald Reagan. Ask people all over the world what it was like to be afraid of drones coming in from President Obama. And for the first time, I'm looking at Americans afraid of their own president, whereas the rest of us know what it's like to be afraid of an American president. And it's fascinating because it's an issue of perspective. Trump is not the worst president in the history of America yet because he's not responsible for 600,000 Iraqi deaths over a lie. He's not responsible for the collapse of the financial system. But he's considered the worst president by a big proportion of the population here because you're afraid of him. And that's an issue of perspective. And that's the point that I make earlier. If I wake up in the morning and my perspective is, oh my God, look at all of the bad things that are going on in the world, I wouldn't be able to do this job. And so I have to be able to step back and I have to be able to think of what can we do today that's incrementally better than what we did yesterday? And how do we make progress towards the ultimate goal, which is a just and sustainable world? And I use both words deliberately because a sustainable world has to be a just world. It has to be inclusive of different faiths, different creeds, different colors, different economic backgrounds. It has to give a pathway to prosperity to those people who don't have it. There's no point in saving the earth if you don't save humans. And there's no point in saving humans if you can't save the world because we need each other. You don't agree? I can see from the nodding of your head. But I, I'm a, I'm a, I, for example, I, I did not come to environment because I care about polar bears, because I'll never see one. I came to the environment because I come from a community that had no prosperity and had no justice. So we all come to this issue for a different reason, but you need to combine that sense of ecology with that sense of humanism in order to get to where we need to get to. And so I'm just emphasizing again, it really is a question of perspective. And one of the things that I've learned over the years is that the opponents that we have on this issue, they have a very simple task because their task is simply no. We like things the way they are, no. And in our community, we often get bogged down by fighting amongst ourselves because we spend so much time talking about our respective theories of change that we lose sight of the common outcome. And I think it's very important for us to understand that we may have different philosophies, we may have different roads that we're taking, but as long as all of those roads are leading to the same outcome, which is a just and sustainable world, and there's room for all of us in this fight. And we have to make yes more palatable than no it's because no at the moment is winning. So I would like to unfortunately interrupt 
what has really been... My voice is happy for you, sir. Yes. <laughs> and I know you have a, a, a drive back to Manchester, and I want to give you time to do that, given what you had told me earlier. I don't know about the rest of you. I know some of you may have had uh, disagreements with, uh, with Edward about what he had to say. I love what you had to say. Not necessarily that I agreed, but you presented so well. And I think it really gave me things to think about. And I thank you so much for coming here. And I'd like to ask you, maybe consider coming back again when maybe those of us who were impressed with, with you and, and, and the way you present things could encourage our neighbors and our friends to come out and attend in a larger venue, because I think you are a fan. So I thank all of you uh, for braving the weather and coming out. Um, and there, I want to thank B, uh, BCTV and, and Maria. There will be a film uh, presentation of this on the station in the weeks ahead. We are going to get a, a, a DVD, right, Maria, that we're going to share. There will be something in the library that can be shared. So what, what uh, Edward had to say tonight can be disseminated wide and far around here. But again, as I said earlier, uh, a moment ago, I really would like to have you back. That's a, and, I, I'm, and I owe you a night out that neither of us can do tonight, but we'll do it. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for coming. Constantly Ooh.